briefing, number 51. Yes. I still feel hungover from the 50th. Well, I've been good, so I don't know what you're talking about. That was the wine tasting last night. Oh, yeah, right. I'm here today, much more casually attired than brown shoes. Mm, I can see how new they are. Yeah, clearly, you never wear them very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, look, pretty big day today in some ways. A, we've come past the 50 milestone, and thanks for Clive and Kate who came along. Yes. And also for all the guys in the back room who came and sat along and had a breakfast beforehand and watched you and I sort out what we're going to say. It was, um, it was enormous fun. It was. We demolished that that cake afterwards. Oh gosh, that was a task, but it and was good fun. You can't see this, but we've we've got a we somebody raised with us. Who was who raised Joe. with us? Joe. Yeah, Joe, thank you very much. We've now gone and expended a large sum of money and I've traded my children in to have a <laughs> microphone that picks everything up. So give us some feedback today about that. Yes. The other thing is we've got a competition going. Karen and I have now both launched our training programs, Karen's operational training programs. They'll, this will come out to you later on today. Ours is the strategic legal training. So we have a competition for all people who are online today. In 30 words, tell us what is the biggest issue that you have in 2021 at your business? And we've got our principal group are going to sit down and go through them and award a winner. And for that, you get to choose which training you want for free delivered at your site. That's a pretty good deal. And with an electrolyte thrown in. No, sorry. <laughs> okay, you okay. that. Okay, yeah, no, that was me, yeah. Okay, so that's the competition. So please, when it comes out to you, it's part of the survey that you get in 30 words or less, what is your biggest issue for 2021? And then you get free training at your site. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right, well, let's kick off. So today we've got two cases we want to deal with. Um, First case is, and the theme I guess we're dealing with this week is doing something according with the rule sounds like a good idea, but if it's not genuine, it's it's always going to have problems. So we've got an HR case that sits in there and we've got a safety case. The HR case is something many of you will understand and many of you have been involved in, that is I've got an enterprise agreement. A business can no longer sustain the enterprise agreement commonly happens when a business has gone bust, gone into administration, you buy the damaged business and you go, well, there's a reason this business went bust. It's got an enterprise agreement which just can't work. In Sphere Healthcare, that's what occurred. They bought a business out of administration. Two things happened. COVID happened and out of the 155 employees they had, 15 were immediately made redundant through that process. Then they had a catastrophic fire and they made redundant the other 140. Then they engaged five people back for the purpose of decommissioning plant. And somebody had the smart idea at that time, oh, we could use them to terminate the enterprise agreement because they, they're friendlies and they will vote to terminate the enterprise agreement. And of course, that all went swimmingly. Now, the key issues are, it is the business who decided to terminate and made it very clear. It said to those five workers, don't worry, whatever you do, you won't be affected financially. They went and terminated it. The commission and inquiring about it found the five workers all knew they were never going to get less than the enterprise agreement that they were terminating. And also then made this comment, uh, it was DP Cross hit it, said, the rules around voting for the termination require that all national um, system employees who are eligible to vote should vote. And he then looked at the legislation and said, well, the, the phrase is usually employed. And when he cross-examined, well, not cross-examined, when he asked questions of Sphere, it's clear that they were going to restart the business mm -hmm. and therefore there would be people who would be re-employed. And so he came to the conclusion there were 140 eligible people who should have been able to vote and he knocked it back. Uh, this is a really old method and, you know, I've certainly been guilty of this method, which is trying to get around enterprise agreements you don't like, getting to a stage where redundancies occur and finding a select group of people who come in who are your friendlies, who they know aren't going to suffer as a result, and they vote. Whenever you do something it's, that has a sleight of hand in it, the commission will always get you mm -hmm. because they can tell that you're not being forthright in what yeah. you're trying to do. It's clever, but is it not clever enough in that those who are very well versed in, you know, reviewing and you know, approving these things, that they will... It's very clear to them what you're trying to do. Yeah, my father used to call it being too smart by half. And that's sort of what happened. And yet there is a, there is powers under the Fair Work Act to apply to the Commission to terminate an enterprise agreement in circumstances just like this, 
where the enterprise agreement is no longer commercially viable for the business. Mm. That requires evidence, but actually they're very open to that because you're being direct about it. Mm. When we try and engage people, there's a number of stakeholders. Fair Work Commission is one stakeholder. The employees you're going to engage again in the future are the next obvious stakeholder. Imagine when they come back and find out, imagine if this got through and it could have been, I think, to be perfectly honest, the decision is flawed and if it ever went on appeal, would not would not survive the appeal and that definition of national system employee. But that said, you're going to get in front of a full bench. You're going to be highly critical in the process where you try to use sleight of hand to get around something when all you had to do was write, make the right application. Workers will always say, look, if, if that's the financial circumstance, I'll live with it. And I've been doing this for 30 years. We, we've often reduced the terms and conditions in employees' business where we can say, quite honestly, we can't actually sustain this business if you don't. And we did it to business after business through COVID mm -hmm. with supportive employees. So I guess what I'm saying, here's a case which shows um, you don't have to try and be sneaky to get the right result. The Fair Work Act provides you with the levers to pull. But the most important thing is think of who your stakeholders are, yep. present employees, future employees, and in dispute, Fair Work Commission. Yep. Now, the AWU in this case would have had very little support from the Fair Work Commission when you buy a business come through administration because it's financially no longer viable. They're not going to get much of a get run in the Fair Work Commission in this space if, you, if, if your numbers are right. Now, so that was the first case. The next case is a um, Safe Work New South Wales case um, and DIC, that's the name of the business, it's DIC, okay? And DIC were an ink manufacturer, you're not meant to smile though. It was an ink manufacturer and they hired a contractor to come in and to clean out one of its um, ink vats. At the bottom of ink vats, like all, all vats that churn products to mix them, there is a, a mechanical agitator. For the contractor to get in there, they had to read the JSA and satisfy the JSA. It was provided by the business. They had to get permits because they were working in an enclosed environment. So they had to get a permit to go in there. Those things are designed to put you on notice of risk. Whenever you're walking into an environment where there can be entrapment, the most important thing is clearly to isolate the, entrap the thing that could entrap you. And there was no way they could have seen the electrical circuitry to actually achieve that and they didn't call an electrician. They just went through the template, which of course didn't, didn't deal with that issue of agitation in an appropriate way. And Karen, I don't know how often we say this, but it's the same template formula. Yes, I can do this, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you're gonna be safe when you do it. When you're working in a confined space, you know it is inherently dangerous. When you walk into an area where there is a mechanical capacity to entrap you, the key thing is isolation. Uh, that's ex not surprisingly, there was very substantial fines given. But what the court district court said is, JSA is not an answer. JSA is just a document. JSA doesn't stop your legs getting trapped. The person died and two was seriously injured. It doesn't do any of that. What it requires you to do is to go and ascertain the risk and have appropriate controls. So I think having a, having a process is great, but it is a process in itself when it comes to documents and forms is incomplete because it's contingent on people having the competency. And I know we're going to touch on competency shortly, but people actually doing the right thing and having the skills to do the right things and complete that process so that it's actually fully effective. Yeah. So let's be really clear about it. There is no such thing as a safe operating procedure for a high risk high risk activity. It requires you every time you undertake that high risk activity to look at what the risks are and apply appropriate controls. The fact that there is a document that says this is what it is, mm. great. Are you happy if I said to you, you're going to stand in front of a wall and someone's going to shoot an inch away from your head, are you going to say, oh, that's okay? That's fine. You tell me that's, you've got a document <laughs> that says that I've definitely missed my head. Aren't you going to actually ask, well, how can I be satisfied that's right? Well, that's what we say to our workers every day when we put them in high-risk activity and say, look, there's the JSA, off you go and do it. The context is different all the time. Yeah, yeah. so look, I, both of us spoke about this earlier because we frequently come against up, up against people who legislatively comply. Mm -hmm. And they'll say to us, oh, no, we've got a JSA for that, or no, we can make that application to the Fair Work Commission. It's no problem because we've got the numbers. Yeah. The short answer is, Compliance alone is not safety, it's not clever, 
it doesn't actually create productivity, it doesn't create risk, risk assessment processes. What, what is required is for people to candidly and honestly identify what are the risks or opportunities they're doing, like in the enterprise agreement, what's the opportunity you're seeking? Mm -hmm. Be honest with your stakeholders, be honest with your adjudicated Fair Work Commission, and you get support. Yeah. In safety, not addressing you know, really high risk in a way which provides obvious safety, like isolation. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. So it's what most organisations are conditioned to, and that's how their risk management framework is set. So yeah. I think like compliance is a great place to be, and it's very important, but it doesn't stop there. No. And look, Karen, it comes to this issue, and I, I know we talk about, and I do this every time, and we're up to number 51, and I still say it every time. Reasonably practical means identifying what is a hazard determining its level of risk and then instituting control based on a hierarchy of control that is supported by the resource of the organisation. In DIC, they identified there is a really high risk and then they had no engineering control to prevent it. You can't have an administrative control. Permits don't stop agitators turning on. You had to have an engineering control. So they're always going to be liable. But the issue that Karen and I want to speak about more today is there are six elements to whether it's a safety or an HR system. They are, is there a plan? Now, is it a macro plan for the organisation as a whole? If Karen's going to recruit, what's the plan at recruitment level? The micro plan. In respect of either one of them, what is the process that governs the management of that? Now, organisations need process because we're aligned by a purpose of delivery that we do. We need everyone doing it the same way. Otherwise, we have risk in itself. From that process comes the requirement of training. So you are trained in what is required, how to do it correctly, but none of that works unless the person is competent because, you know, you can train me as a lawyer. And you, in fact, if you came for me and asked me to do say, a land for you, well, I did it at university, but I couldn't possibly do it for you. I wouldn't know what to do. So being trained in it doesn't make me competent in it. And in due diligence obligations, no officer and organisation can rely on a safe system where there isn't competency base in the training. You then go down to, well, is the supervisor capable? Do they understand what the macro plan is? Do they understand what the micro plan is? Do they know what the process and their toolkit? What is it that I've got to do? Are these people trained and capable and competent? Are they? Yes, okay. Then I can supervise towards it. How as an organisation do I monitor that as occurring? And finally, the sixth element, how do I report back against the plan that has satisfied myself, A, innovation and learning, mm -hmm. but C, that if we actually did, we achieve what we're trying to achieve. So if we remember there the six elements of system, a system is not a JSA. A system is not a group of policies and procedures. That's the process that delivers the plan. That's all it does. The rest of it is the system. Mm, is the action. Is the yeah. System, yeah. And I guess that brings us over to what we're talking about today. Because we launched our training, we thought we'd talk about the importance of training. I've told you how it fits in with those six elements and why it's so important. But for me, I guess the part that I want you to get across, and I get Karen to speak more in more detail about the three levels of training, which are absolutely critical in capability management. But I want people to understand that training in itself creates no value. Training must be directed to the risk. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a high risk, and the classic one is bullying. Once a year we do bullying training. But you might have an area in your business where it's happening all the time. You, you, you can't stop the training until you're satisfied there is the learning and capability. So it may mean in an area where there's some behaviour that needs fixing, you'll train every two or three months. Until you're satisfied there's a level of performance of that competent skill, you've got to keep training. And if we're talking about confined spaces, um, you are going to be training people about how to actually work in a confined space. It's not enough they get a permit. Mm -hmm. The risks in a confined space are so real, particularly where there is mechanical entrapment risk. So maybe I'll chuck over to you about the three layers of when we talk about training, what are we talking about and why is it so important? Yeah. So you, you touched on there in terms of the importance of training being competency or the need for training to be competency based. Well, that, that's really important. And we need to define what those competencies are because I talk about three layers when it comes to training. Firstly, aside from rolling out a training module or starting off a training program, it actually starts at the very top. I mean, and you look at the organisation and you ask the question, 
what is the workforce, what, 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 in terms of my workforce, what capabilities and competency do we actually need? Now that's based on your strategy, that's based on your business plan. Maybe there's been a change, maybe there's been a significant shift in terms of what you're doing and where you're going. How does that actually alter the makeup of your workforce and the skills and experience that's now required? So once you're clear on that, you go to the next layer and that's looking across it functionally across your business. So that could, that's every operational function because there are tie-ins across the whole business, not just one area. Okay? After you're clear in terms of what each function actually needs, um, in terms of, again, the, the skills and the competency that's required to, in order to, for them to be able to deliver um, the result or the objectives for the organisation, we then look at the role. Okay, so, so how does this filter down in terms of the individual roles that support our organisation? And through there, it's about defining and profiling. Um, this goes with the job design in terms of what is it that each person or each role, how does that contribute to the overall picture? And therefore, in identifying those, um, those specific skills or competencies, we then can be in a position to actually create a program that will you know, allow people to do exactly what they need to do um, to be able to deliver on the, the whole picture. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And look, in its pure form, you see it in elite, elite team sports. Absolutely. Where they say, look, here's our, here's our team plan. This is, the, this is how we're going to run today. Mm. Karen, your role is this. Now, Karen can kick both feet. She can do a whole lot of things. But your role will be, as the ball comes out of the pack, you go to the right. Mm -hmm. Does that mean Karen's got other skills? Yes, she does. But role definition and clarity is absolutely critical and sport in its elite level is a pure form of showing mm. how that training as it goes from you need to learn to play football, mm -hmm. you need to learn to play in the team in the area you're playing and you need to do this role mm. and you see it fail so often in sport because people don't actually play their role or they don't get the team, they don't get the culture of the team, yeah. they, haven't been, they haven't been inducted into what it's like to be a North Melbourne or a Hawthorne or whatever player, they don't yeah. know what it feels like. <laughs> and the two of us do know what it feels like because you're a North Melbourne supporter and I'm a Hawthorne I'm supporter. doing too well at the moment. So anyway. And I can tell you culturally, we're not happy with it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me touch on this, Andrew. I, I want to use an example of people management training, okay? Because if you're looking at a role, often you'll, you'll let's look at a, you know, uh, an operations manager training or uh, operations manager in terms of the need to have um, mm -hmm. great capability, strong capability in people management. Now, is that just specific to that role? Because yes, it is. But it actually has every, every management role or any role that manages people requires that competency. So it's just not enough to be saying, okay, so we need this person to be able to, um, to be able to do this properly. Well, what about the person, what about the manager to which that manager reports to? And across the organization, you can't build capability that applies across the whole organization to one specific person or one area because that's incomplete. And that's the reason why I'm suggesting that you look at it as a whole and yep. filter across so you get that consistency. And look at coming down to what we talk about in training, the most important thing is that everyone knows what good looks like. Hmm. So yes, you get down to the ultimate part of saying, Karen, your job is this, and this is how I want you to execute. But if you don't know how to engage in, in the way that is required with each person to achieve that outcome as a team, team fails. So that's why we break into those three layers. And look, Let's just step back for due diligence. You know, the officer's liability, that's any person who has control or substantial control of an organisation, directors, executive members, sometimes significant, significant operational people if it controls more than a large part of the business. Those people must do these things. They must have a knowledge of the nature of risk that sits there. This is to sever vicarious liability of the organisation and the individual of that organisation from the acts of a person who does something wrong. So whether it's safety, whether it's discrimination, whether it's, you know, whether it's corporations breaches that exist, the officers particularly must say, look, what are the risks that we're facing? What is the law that applies to those risks, the current law that applies to those risks? What are the nature of the controls to meet those risks? Do we have a system that measures, monitors and reports against those? And are we applying resources, sufficient resources to ensure that that system has integrity and works. Now that's what due diligence means as a matter of law, whether it's Corporations Act. So if we're training people and that training is not capability based or it's incomplete or it's individualized or it's lacking coherence across the group, mm -hmm. somebody gets injured, there is absolutely no doubt the vicarious liability of the organization stays. The organization would definitely be liable. So why train people? 
<laughs> Even sexual well, harassment. What? Well, well, because we got it signed off. That's we right. Train people. Yeah. So off. what? What? What protection? Now, for the officer who then looks into the organisation and says, <laughs> um, you know, these people are trained. Are they competent? I mean, can I can I be satisfied? My six elements of the system. Can I be satisfied? They're true. No, no. We've got a training register. What does a training register do? It's a bloody roll call. <laughs> it shows that someone was present. All of us went to school. There's a whole lot of dumb kids in my school who definitely were present well, at it's, one it's, level. It's helpful, but it's incomplete. <laughs> okay, it's, yeah, well, yeah, it's good to I'm know who turned you. up, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's nice to know who turned up, but lights on nobody home is still yeah. lights on nobody home. So what that means is it undermines the due diligence obligations. And so the dominoes fall. First, the organisation stays liable, but worse still, the officers who ought to have known of that mm. failing. But because they never understood process is not is not a system it's just paper yeah. those six elements are what the system is and to get that the core in the middle of that is nobody should do a job they're not capable of doing competently and we are satisfied they are competent to do yeah. and that goes to the heart of both hr systems oh systems financial systems and operational yeah, systems system. yeah. okay i've gone on too long because i get to be excited about that so it's let's great. go on to our problem so hit the problem <laughs> okay, I'll read this out. David had a pronounced physical disfigurement. He had cysts on his head. His boss, Jean, asked if he was coming to the Christmas drinks. She valued David greatly and wanted to celebrate with him and his team. David declined because the young men in the team had made jokes about his appearance when he went to Friday drinks once. He had asked them to stop, which they did, but he saw them texting and laughing afterwards. David complained to HR, who said they would talk to the group. Since that time, David said they don't care about being told off, but are worse when drinking. He said he felt hurt and ashamed of his appearance because of them. Jean said she would ensure that didn't happen at the Christmas drinks and said, please, David, we'd love you to come along. So he agreed. Next, it's two pages. I've remembered. Two days before the Christmas party, the bullying and harassment, bullying harassment discrimination policy was forwarded to all employees who had to tick. They had read it before the screen would open and allow them to use their own computer. Lunchtime seminar the day before reminded people of the policy. A roll call was taken of who attended and two examples of breaches of policy were worked through, one of sexual harassment, the other of bullying. No testing employees were undertaken. David had only been at the party a short time when he overheard a drunken group of young men making offensive remarks about his appearance and laughing loudly. He was not prepared for how vile the remarks were. He went straight home but could not return to work. His doctor said he had suffered PTSD. He has terrible nightmares and now has trouble leaving his house. Now, a sad, a sad one today, mm. but can I just say that is actually drawn bits and pieces from three matters I've dealt with last year. Wow. Okay? okay, so let's go to the poll, and I think you've got a minute to go. Let's shoot, let's go. Few red flags in that one. Even. It was a few red flags in that one. It certainly was a few red flags, <laughs> wasn't it? All right, probably five seconds to go. Okay, it's moment two, one. All right, she is, oh, just missed it. I'm gonna share the results, Andrew. Okay, let's share the results. You need to share it in big for me because I can't see, yeah. see that. See that. All right, the first first question was had a double negative in, so I'm sorry, as I read this through, and I think I wrote this at 2.30 in the morning, so it's not so good. Did the delivery of the policy and training by David's business mean he could not be liable for the misconduct of its employees? So remember the vicarious liability discussion we had? The issue here is um, it doesn't matter what law it was, did the organisation have a capacity through its training to create a competence 
and understanding what the replica repercussions were to sever that liability? And the answer is no, it definitely didn't sever that vicarious liability. Okay. I, I, isn't that interesting? Because this is how most people train for these issues. Is, mm. is they think that's good enough. There is a really good way, and um, your training certainly does it, of setting out a very simple set of questions which test randomly yep. what people's skills are. But people must be able to read a policy and understand language is a tool mm -hmm. and understand how to utilise that tool. When we train in sexual harassment and discrimination claims, what we say to people very clearly at the, at the end of it is say, look, you've been trained on this. We've now tested you on it. If you do this, um, it's your house that's on the line. It's not us. Mm. You, it's your house on the line. It's your responsibility. And that's how we deal with the discipline and performance behaviours that come after it. So it is a consistent threat. But at the moment, that wouldn't protect you. And in fact, if the officers were aware of that, fa that significant failure, there could be officer liability that sits behind it. Different question. Is general appearance a protected attribute in discrimination law in Victoria? Now, that's pretty hard to know unless you do know it. In fact, in 2005, it was introduced into the Equal Opportunity Act in Victoria as a result of a tramways case where a woman who was a substantial woman had trouble climbing on and off um, a train and she was sacked, or a tram, I think it was a tram actually. And as a result of the case, which found out that there was no way of actually protecting her because of a perception of her being a fat woman, mm. and that was the reason she was sacked, mm. um, the law was changed to say the general appearance in Victoria. Now, in this case, there's other protected attributes there because there's a medical condition. So there's other ways of attaching liability to it. But I want you to be very clear in Victoria. And it, I think it's an enlightened thing to say. We don't talk about what people look like. We don't judge people on appearance. It's a good thing it's there and yeah. it would definitely be protecting Victoria. Could David claim he's been bullied? Remember, we always do the legal tests here. Was there repetitive action against David? Yes, there was. Is there evidence of that? We're not quite sure, but we think there is. Mm -hmm. um, was that objectionably unreasonable? Did it cause hurt, humiliation, or intimidation? Yes, it did. Did it make his workplace unsafe? Yes, it did. It's bullying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would David have a viable common law claim for damages? And the answer is absolutely yes, because of the duty that existed to prevent foreseeable injury. He'd actually raised the nature of the injury. Jean actually knew what that risk was. Mm. But the group continued to do it and they ought not have done it and they could have been prevented from doing it. So it's a lay down misere. And the last part of negligence is, is there a duty? What's the standard of care? Okay. Was there damage? Yes, there was. So the claim's up. Could David's employee be liable under safety law? Now, what do people say under that? You'll have to scroll down because I can't see that one. Uh, yes, yeah. overwhelmingly. Yes, and you're absolutely right. And you're right on a whole lot of interesting grounds. So, yes, we've got the primary duty breach. That was very easy, wasn't it? The individuals who did this, I think, run the risk of um, reckless endangerment because they've been told by Jean not to do it. They've been told the impact, the reading between the lines, and yet they were indifferent as to the level of damage they caused, and they caused serious injury, reckless endangerment. So they could be off to jail for that. So when we're training, I want people to understand what behaviour looks like when you map it out against the law, because it really says, I don't want to try and scare people to go into jail with industrial manslaughter and reckless endangerment, but they do need to know if they conduct a piece of behaviour which has the risk of causing serious injury, injury or death. They do it indifferent to that risk. They do something that is indifferent to that risk and bullying commonly is indifferent to that risk and it does actually cause serious injury or death. You're in strife. Mm. So please, we've had this recently in a call centre where you commonly get a real mixture of people in call centres, but you also are inclined to have sort of an alpha male character who behaves particularly badly and it just keeps happening. And nobody deals with them because you have a whole lot of people from overseas, vulnerable people who are working in these places who desperately need to work, who are highly stressed by the nature of the work they're doing, being treated poorly by a character who you know, they have high use of drugs and alcohol and they have all the sorts of problems in the world in call centres, they're complex places. But I just raise that now. So yes, safety law breach is not just the primary duty breach, it's also a monitoring breach. And finally, um, the overwhelming breach, of course, is reckless endangerment for the individuals. Now, I've got a couple of messages that have come up on the screen, Karen. Yeah, so I've got here. Um, so 
if David had suicided, would there also be industrial manslaughter and employees charge as per Brodie's law? Yeah, Brodie's law is slightly different. So Brodie's law is actually a stalking law. But yes, there could well be what's called workplace manslaughter in Victoria or in the other three states and territories that have an industrial manslaughter. Um, would depend on the grossness of misbehaviour as to whether it would. It's marginal on the basis of the facts that we have here. Okay. All right, guys, that's time. Thank you for coming to number 51. Karen and I have survived. We've both been... We had music today. So we had, we had let music us know today, what you think. Yeah, let us know. And please, in under 30 words, come to us and tell us what is the issue that's biggest for you in 2021 and then choose the training you want. Okay. See you then. See you. Bye-bye.